Every year, the European Academy of Sciences awards the Blaise Pascal Medal to outstanding scientists. This year, distinguished professor Susan Scott has become the first Australian to receive the medal. Based at the Australian National University, her work on gravitational waves has earned her the top prize. So what exactly does that work entail? Cosmos sat down with Susan to find out. Susan, congratulations on the Blaise Pascal Medal. Thank you very much. It's very exciting. For those of us who just tuned in, what are gravitational waves? Now, that's a very interesting question because they're a different type of wave to the ones we're used to. So throughout human's existence, we've been using electromagnetic waves to observe things, light, radio waves, x-rays, and so on. So it's a new type of wave in a new spectrum. And they are a direct prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity. So we've known about them coming from the theory, if you like, for just over 100 years, but we haven't been able to detect them until quite recently because they're such a small effect. And what they are are very tiny ripples in the fabric of space-time, and they're caused by uh, masses moving around in a not perfectly uh, symmetric fashion. So things like two black holes spinning around each other and then colliding. Of course, the the denser the material and the faster they're moving, the, the, the stronger the waves and the more chance we have of detecting them. And I guess the other thing you should know about them is that also coming from the theory, they're predicted to move outwards from the source at the speed of light. What is it about gravitational waves that's earned you this award? How have you been involved in them? In, in research on gravitational waves, I should say. I've really been involved in it since the beginning, is, is the short answer. I, my background is I'm a general relativity theorist. So I also do research in, in gravity theory generally, things to do like singularities of space-time, such as we find in the heart of black holes or at the start of the universe, and uh, work related to that. I'd been in Oxford for four years working with Roger Penrose on on that sort of work, and I came back to Australia to to take up a postdoc at the ANU. And I saw at that time, this is about 98, that we had a a couple of groups working in Australia at ANU and Perth, um, dealing with the experimental side of the project, so developing aspects of components of the gravitational wave detectors, which were just about, you know, being built at that time, literally. But we had no effort in Australia in the gravitational wave science side of the project, which is, you know, what we expect to get out of observing gravitational waves coming from cataclysmic events in space. And so I thought with my background, and given that we have this experimental project already, you know, rooted in Australia, so it was was underway, I thought, well, we need to develop the uh, gravitational wave science data analysis uh, theory side as well. And so I started activities at at that time. We did quite a range of things in, in that field because bearing in mind, gravitational waves weren't detected until 2015. So that was 17 years later. But obviously, there's a lot of things that need to be developed in terms of data analysis systems and searches and search techniques and and all sorts of things um, that, that, you know, took a lot of preparation. And during that time, we grew in numbers. And, uh, you know, now we have a really healthy population in Australia of people who work in gravitational wave data analysis and theory uh, and uh, are part of our centre of excellence for gravitational wave discovery called OSGRAV. That ability to combine the sort of brain power and the and the ability to to make these observations is a big part of the the way gravitational wave research has grown in Australia. Yes, exactly. Because in the end, you know, the whole project consists of sort of two parts, if you like. One big part is the actual detectors, and and they were being built in the in the nineties, and since then we've been upgrading them and making them more sensitive. But that's really the experimental physicist, uh, engineer type side of the project. And uh, we did have that in Australia. But the other part, which is becoming increasingly grown and important, is to, you know, look at the science that we're now getting through the detections that we've been having since 2015 of things like two black holes colliding or two neutron stars and and so on. And, And really... 
I think if we hadn't, if I hadn't started that program in the late 90s, in 98, we may not have been in a position uh, to be ready with, with our, you know, people in Australia at the time of detection and to exploit that new window uh, beyond that. And thankfully we are, and Australia plays a, quite a, a leading role in, in that side of the project as well. So following that detection seven years ago, there's been a lot more gravitational wave detections. There have. We've now achieved, uh, uh, I think, just over 90 detections, and, and they've all been mostly binary black holes, but that tells us a lot about those systems. The more we get, the more we know about the, the lives, lives, the really deaths of, of uh, black holes throughout the universe, for instance, um, their sizes, ideas about how and where they get together, how fast they're spinning, you know, do they form in isolated environments or, you know, in really dense systems in the center of galaxies or whatever. So a lot about those, but we've also had a couple of uh, binary neutron star collisions and, and they're fantastic because one of the big things we're going after now uh, is the question, what are neutron stars? What are they made of? You know, what sort of material do they consist of? They're, they're a really big enigma to us. They're the densest type of star in the universe. You know, black holes are denser, but they're not really a star anymore. They're a sort of geometric object. Neutron stars are about the size of Canberra. So they're not very big, but they pack a lot of mass into that size. So they're, they're the densest type of material that we know of in the universe. And we cannot reproduce that here on Earth in laboratories. So we look to observing gravitational waves from neutron stars, which we haven't done yet from a single neutron star to try to unlock the incredible mysteries associated with those objects. I guess back on Earth a little bit, um, you're the first Australian recipient of this medal. Is it important to you that as a woman in science, you've managed to get this very prestigious award? I think it's really important, actually. Um, I suppose throughout my career, and obviously for a long time before that, it was always the case that, you know, if something like that would happen, you know, some uh, award or recognition it, in science, it, it nearly always would be a man who was first. It is, a, you know, it is a refreshing, it's encouraging um, that that's not always the case anymore, that, you know, in a case where no Australian has achieved something in, in science, that the, the first person may be a woman. And I think that is a real breakthrough because, you know, for most of my career, that was not the case. And it's really only been quite recently that, you know, we've seen that change to some extent. Where do you think the barriers for female physicists are? Well, I think there are barriers right throughout the whole process of, you know, becoming a scientist and having a, a scientific career and, uh, and so on. But to me, I mean... I lecture in the second semester of third year teaching general relativity, and that's mm -hmm. the, the final semester for many uh, students. And by the time they get to me, uh, the start of that semester, there's virtually no women uh, in the class, you know, a couple maybe. And, and so I feel that the, the problem starts really way down the line, e.g. at uh, primary school. We know that um, girls can become very disenchanted and disinterested in the way science is taught there. I've been involved in recent years with a very exciting project called Einstein First, uh, which aims to roll out totally new um, techniques of teaching modern physics to primary and secondary school students throughout Australia and beyond by using different um, methods, e.g. role-playing, playing with things, uh, toys and things that they're already familiar with and enjoy and bringing out scientific concepts in those ways and songs and all sorts of things. But we, we found so far that the, at the end of these periods uh, using this new method, the, the girls remain as interested at the end as they were at the beginning, which is not generally the case with the, the standard teaching methods at present. 
that's really cool that you've identified that point because obviously it's not the same for say biology for instance where there are many more women at undergraduate that cliff kind of appears at different points in science so it's cool that you're heading right back to the origins for this in primary school yes because i think if we can make the difference there then it will flow you know up the system through secondary and beyond and in the end what we want is for more uh, women in particular, but people in general coming through the system, students, to choose STEM disciplines because it's so important for the, the future of, of our country, its health, but also the entire planet. We, we need great minds coming through and working in all these scientific areas to really ensure you know, the future. 